On the morning of January 4th, 1992 at 9.30 a.m., two men entered the Sakasuds convenience store in Wazoo City, a small rural town located in Beecham County, Alabama. Minutes later, three eyewitnesses who were local residents of the area heard a gunshot and saw the two men run from the store, get in their metallic green convertible and flee the scene. The police were called and they found the body of the clerk on duty at the time, 33-year-old James Willis, sprawled on the floor in front of the counter. He had been shot once in the back of the head at point-blank range with a high-caliber weapon. Fifteen minutes later, police spotted a green convertible driven by two men matching the description of the suspects and arrested them on suspicion of murder. The two men arrested were William Gambini, 21, of New York City, and Stanley Rothenstein, also 21 and from New York City. The pair had been friends for several years after meeting at New York University and were on a road trip from New York to California as they had both recently been accepted for scholarships to UCLA. According to the police report, they had stopped at the Saka Suds to pick up some supplies and Gambini had shoplifted a can of star-kissed tuna. On the way out of the store, Gambini got into an altercation with the victim, James Willis, and shot and killed him, then fled the store with the tuna. The murder weapon, which forensic testing found to be a 357 Magnum revolver, was not found. Although the evidence was entirely circumstantial, Gambini confessed to the murder as soon as he was brought in for questioning, stating that he was the one that did the shooting and that Rothenstein had nothing to do with it. Here is the police recording of that confession. Hello, Bill. I'm Sheriff Farley. Hi. Do you know why you're here? Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. It was a stupid thing to do. Have you been made aware of your rights? Yes. You're willing to waive that right? Yes. I'm willing to cooperate fully. I'll sign a statement or whatever makes this whole thing easier. Good. Good. That's, that's good. But I want you to know, Stan, he had nothing to do with it. Did he help you plan it? No. I mean, I mean, it wasn't planned out, you know, just like, you know, it just happened. Did Stan try to stop you at any time? No. I mean, he was... Why, is that a big deal? Aiding and abetting. Aiding and abetting? What is that, a major thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Next friends at NYU, and we both applied and we got scholarships to UCLA. So we figured the weather and the scenery would be nicer going through the south. What about the tuna fish? Then I forgot about the can of tuna fish, and then we, we left. Did he catch you with the tuna fish? Is that how it started? No, he didn't say anything. But he knew about it. I don't know. Let's talk about that for a moment. You paid for the groceries. And then what? We went out to the car, and that's it. When did you shoot him? What? At what point did you shoot the clerk? I shot the clerk. Yes, when did you shoot him? I shot the clerk. Hey, Dean, we need you out here. I'm in the middle of a damn confession here. Rothenstein corroborated this version of events in his interview, stating that he didn't help or plan the murder with Gambini. An accessory? Are you guys kidding? An accessory? I didn't help. I didn't plan it. You didn't try to stop it? I didn't know what was happening. I found out later in the car. Why didn't you get out? Call the police then? He's my friend. <laughs> well... Your friend has put you in a lot of trouble. What's going to happen to Bill? Nothing. Unless he's convicted. Of course, if he is, we're going to run enough electricity through him to light up Birmingham. Gambini later recanted his confession, stating that he believed he was being questioned regarding the shoplifted can of tuna instead of the murder, and that he and Rothenstein were innocent. However, the district attorney, Jim Trotter, 
found that there was enough evidence to proceed with the case and Gambini was charged with first degree murder and Rothenstein as an accessory, with both potentially facing the death penalty if found guilty. Gambini hired his cousin, Vincent LaGuardia Gambini, to represent him and Rothenstein in the case. Vincent Gambini was a personal injury lawyer from Brooklyn, newly admitted to the bar and with no trial experience. It later came to light that he fabricated his level of experience to the trial judge, Chamberlain Haller, in order to be allowed to take the case. Throughout the trial, he demonstrated a limited knowledge of basic courtroom procedures and dress code and was repeatedly held in contempt for his disrespectful and unprofessional attitude. In an unexpected move at the preliminary hearing, he did not cross-examine any of the witnesses, adding to the appearance that the district attorney had a strong case, and the trial was set to begin on Monday, February 2nd at 10 a.m. After Gambini's poor showing at the preliminary hearing, Rothenstein fired him and decided to use the public defender, John Gibbons, to represent him in the case. However, in his cross-examination of the first witness, his line of questioning actually assisted the prosecution's case, and Rothenstein rehired Gambini. On the third day of the trial, the DA produced a surprise witness, FBI forensic analyst George Wilbur. Wilbur testified that the pattern and chemical analysis of the tire marks left at the scene of the crime matched Michelin model XGV size 75R 14 inch wheels, which were identical to the type used on William Gambini's car, pictured here. In response, Gambini called his own expert witness on cars, Mona Vito, who was also his girlfriend. She testified that the tire marks, as shown in this picture from the crime scene, were too flat and even to have been made by William's 1964 Buick Skylark and that only a car with an independent rear suspension and posit traction could have made such marks. One model of car with these features is the similar looking 1963 Pontiac Tempest. And because both Buick and Pontiac are owned by GM, the Pontiac Tempest was also available in metallic mint green, the same color on William Skylark. Gambini then recalled the FBI expert witness, George Wilbur, who confirmed this information, effectively discrediting his own testimony. Local Sheriff Dean Farley was then called to the stand by Gambini, and he testified that two men who fit William and Stanley's descriptions had been arrested in Georgia for driving a stolen metallic mint green Pontiac Tempest, equipped with the same tires as William's car, and they were in possession of a 357 Magnum revolver which was a gun of the same caliber used to kill the clerk. This gun was later matched by police investigators to the bullet used in the murder. In light of this new evidence, all charges against William and Stanley were dismissed and the two were freed from police custody. They continued on their trip to California and both later graduated from UCLA. Vincent Gambini married his girlfriend, continued to practice law in New York and also dabbled in a career in music releasing his debut album in 1998. Titled Vincent LaGuardia Gambini Sings Just For You, it featured such songs as Wise Guy, Yo Cousin Vinny, and Take Your Love and Shove It. The album was a commercial failure, and Gambini has released no further music since then.